I thought it would work better to record um, me talking about uh, um, labor demand and showing you some slides. Uh, so I've never done something like this, so I, I, I hope it works, um, and I'd appreciate your feedback on it. First, before we talk about labor demand, we should talk a little bit about labor markets. Um, in labor markets, households are the suppliers and firms are the demanders. Um, a lot of times we talk about work using language that's different. We would say, um, I need a job, I'm looking for a job, I want a job. We talk about the job as though it's the thing. But in economics, we recognize that what, what's really valuable is the labor, it's the effort. So as the worker, you have that and you um, look for a willing buyer uh, for that product that you have. Uh, so the roles of demand and supply are a little are switched from what we're normally used to thinking about in product markets. Okay, so the workers will, will be on the supply side, which means that in this um, lesson we're focusing on the firm, uh, who's the demander of labor. Just like in a product market, there's a price. That price in the labor market is called the wage. Of course, there are different elements of compensation, and as you know, you create more and more complicated models. You add those things in. We're going to keep it real simple and just talk about the wage. You can talk about wages in nominal terms or real terms. Nominal means that you're just talking about the dollar amount. That's the way I'll be using it today. Um, but you can also talk about wages in real terms, which means you're dividing that dollar amount by some index of prices to pay attention to whether the purchasing power of the wage is going up or down. So if you get a 10% raise on the same day that all prices in the economy go up by 10%, uh, your nominal wage has gone up but your real wage has not. The demand for labor is what we call in economics a derived demand. This means that uh, the firm is not demanding labor because there's some benefit, um, direct benefit from them consuming uh, labor. Rather, the demand for labor is derived from the fact that they're trying to maximize profits and the only way they can do that is to hire workers to make products. Um, an analogy for this might be how um, individuals demand medical care, not because you get any utility from medical care, but rather because you demand health. Um, and so your demand for health leads to a, a demand for medical care. In the same way, a firm's pursuit of profits um, creates an, a demand for labor. Well, just like any optimizing um, economic actor, the firm is um, comparing the marginal benefits and the marginal costs of a decision. So when um, deciding whether or not to hire, uh, the firm looks at the marginal benefit and the marginal cost. When a firm hires a worker, two things happen. One, the firm's total costs go up because you have to pay the worker. Um, in our simple model, that's it. But in more complicated models, of course, you have to train the worker and you have to give the worker benefits and, and so on. Um, but also, at the same time that costs go up, revenues go up um, because the worker is going to produce output and you're going to sell that output. So you have both cost and revenue going up. Remember that profit is revenue minus cost. So if revenue and cost both increase when you hire a worker, it's possible that profits could go up or down or stay the same, depending on how quickly uh, one or the other goes up. Well, the cost of hiring the worker in our model is just the wage. It's, I think, fairly easy for us to, um, to understand. The benefit is a little more complicated. The benefit of hiring a worker is how much you're going to make from selling the output that you can only produce after you hire that worker that you otherwise can't produce. Well, that term is called marginal product. The marginal product of labor is the additional output produced after the last unit of labor is hired. So if I take the marginal product, MP, and I multiply it by the product's price, how much it sells for on the market, then I get a concept called marginal revenue product, MRP. Uh, marginal revenue product, rather than focusing on how much output do I get from hiring one more worker, marginal revenue product answers the question, how much revenue do I get from hiring the additional worker? Well, now I have a benefit measured in dollars, additional revenue from hiring the worker, and a cost measured in dollars, the wage, and so I can make a comparison. If, um, as we know, the marginal product falls, this is the law of diminishing returns, then that means that the marginal revenue product also falls as you hire more workers. 
I'm going to assume for simplicity here that the wage is determined in a, a either in a competitive market or in some other way so that it's fixed, so the wage is not uh, changing here. As I hire more and more workers, their marginal product falls, and that means their marginal revenue product falls. Of course, remember the reason the marginal product falls is because I'm holding everything else constant. I'm only hiring more workers, so I'm not adding capital or anything like that. As I add more of one input to a fixed amount of other inputs, the marginal product has to fall because then I have less, say, capital per worker. Uh, you know, a real quick example, if I have a grocery store that has five um, cash registers, if I hire enough workers, five workers, to man each of those cash registers, then um, I get a certain uh, certain return. As I continue to add workers without adding any more registers, I get less and less additional output. Sure, maybe I can add a sixth worker so that way when the other ones go on, on break, I don't have to have the registers empty uh, or something. But there's going to be a point at which those kinds of um, opportunities to produce more are going to run out. So as I just continue to add cashiers and cashiers and cashiers to only five registers, uh, I would expect that the additional output I get from an additional cashier is going to fall. Eventually it's going to reach zero, and if I am really going crazy and just flooding the store with employees, uh, the marginal product would become negative. They would start to get in each other's way. So the marginal product falls. That's the, that's the important point here. So this is the basic problem the firm solves. If the marginal revenue product, what you earn after you hire one more worker, is greater than what you pay that worker, then you should hire that worker because hiring that worker will increase your profit. But as you hire that worker and additional workers, if the marginal revenue product remains higher than the wage, that marginal revenue product falls. And it falls until eventually it's equal to the wage, right? Because it began higher than the wage, so you hired, and now it's uh, equal to the wage. Once it's equal to the wage, there's no benefit anymore from hiring workers, so hiring stops. Um, really, this is a kind of a, you know, a, a marginal decision here. If you hire this last worker, um, profits won't change. So it's okay to hire this worker. It's okay not to, but you certainly wouldn't want to keep hiring beyond this point because then the marginal revenue product would fall below the wage, of course, and then you'd be spending more money than you're making on these workers. So, so this condition, marginal revenue product equals wage, gives us the um, profit maximizing solution for the firm. Let's look at a, um, a table, a numerical example that might make this clear. In the first column I have different options for the number of workers I could hire. In the second column how much output I get at uh, that level of hiring. So notice that as I hire more workers I get more output, however the rate at which output goes up is falling. as It goes from 0 to 10, then only to 18, then 24, and so on. So I calculate the marginal product in the third column. This is the additional output from hiring that worker. So notice that the first worker adds a 10 units of output to total output because it goes from 0 to 10. The second worker adds only 8 as output goes from 10 to 18. And the third worker has a marginal product of 6 because output goes from 18 to 24 and so on. In the fourth column, I have the price of the output, which I'm just assuming is a constant $2. It doesn't matter how many I produce. The price is $2. Now, it's a competitive market. Go back to the micro basics for that. So then I can calculate the marginal revenue product simply by multiplying the third and fourth columns. How much do they produce, and how much can I sell each one for? So the marginal product of 10 for the first worker times the price of 2 gives a marginal revenue product of $20 for that worker. The uh, sixth column is the wage. Again, it's a constant wage here. It's $10. Um, and then so in the, the next two columns, I have revenue and cost. Revenue is simply the price of the output, the fourth column, times the amount of output, the second column. So if I hire one worker, I produce 10 units of output, then I sell for $2 each, that's $20. If I hire two workers, I produce 18 units of output, which I sell for $2 each, that's $36. And if I hire three workers, I produce 24 units of output, which I sell for $2 each. That's $48, and so on. Cost, simply, is the number of workers times the wage. I'm assuming away things like my fixed cost, my cost of capital. Um, even if I were to add them in here, they'd be constant, so they wouldn't change the solution. They would just change the numbers. Okay, so if I hire one worker, it's a $10 cost. Two workers is 20 and so on. So then I just do the subtraction problem, and I get profit.
And so what we notice here is that profit is maximized at a level of $18 of profit. What we also can recognize is that for the first, second, and third workers, the marginal revenue product was higher than the wage. And so it was profit increasing to hire those workers. Um, as I hire the first worker, I earn 20 but spend 10, so profit goes up 10. As I hire the second worker, I earn 16, spend 10, so profit goes up 6. When I hire the third worker, I spend 12, I'm sorry, I spend 10, but I earn 12, and so profit goes up by $2. So I stop hiring there. Because if the firm were to hire the fourth worker, notice that the fourth worker only earns $8 for the firm, but it costs 10. That's going to reduce profits by $2. So this example also kind of illustrates another thing, which is that the marginal revenue product is not exactly equal to the wage here, but it's as close to equal as it can get um, without costing the firm any profit. So we could look at this another way and say that we're going to hire each worker that has a marginal revenue product higher than their wage, and that's only the first, second, and third workers. Well, what if the wage changes? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change the wage from $10 to $14. When I do that, the three columns that are going to change are the sixth, eighth, and ninth columns, wage and costs and profit. Nothing about revenue will change here, just the wages, the costs, and the profit. So as I change that to $14, notice that my costs have gone up at every level of output and my profits have fallen. But something else has happened the maximum level of profits is now not associated with three workers but rather just two notice the first worker has a marginal revenue product of twenty higher than the wage of fourteen the second worker has a marginal revenue product of sixteen higher than the wage of fourteen but the third worker and all the workers after have marginal revenue products below the wage so the profit maximizing solution is to hire two workers not three so when the wage goes up the firm hires less labor well, this is sort of like the law of demand, right? If the price of something goes up, you'll demand fewer units of it. The same is true for the firm. If the wage goes up, ceteris paribus, all else equal, the firm is going to demand uh, fewer workers. Why? Because there will be fewer workers that have a marginal revenue product high enough to justify paying that wage. Imagine if we raised the minimum wage to $20. Um, do you think that there would be a lot of people employed in fast food and, and, and other places like this after that minimum wage? Would firms just um, deal with it? Probably not. There are very few people um, that can produce $20 worth of output in an hour. And no firm is going to voluntarily hire somebody to produce less than $20 if they had to pay them 20 And that's the idea here. Well, what else can change um, the demand for labor uh, besides just changes in the wage? Well, anything that affects any other part of our story. A change in productivity that changes the marginal product of the workers will raise their or lower their marginal revenue product, and that can change the result. So if productivity goes up, marginal revenue product goes up, and firms will hire more workers. Changes in the product price. This is really important. If um, the price of the thing that you sell goes up, then that means that your workers, even if they're no more productive, all now have a higher marginal revenue product. They're bringing in more revenue, which means that you can um, hire more of them. This is uh, the way that uh, demand for labor is linked to the demand for the product, right? So if the demand for um, shoes increases, then the demand for people who make shoes will also increase as well. Uh, and we didn't have this in our story, our very simple story, but realize that changes in other inputs um, can affect us as well. Here we've got a marginal condition for if I have two inputs, labor and capital. So the marginal revenue product of labor divided by the wage, which, by the way, should be equal to 1, will be equal to the same thing for capital. But if the pr marginal product of capital changes, if the price of capital changes, it's going to change um, the mix of capital and labor that I use. Sometimes capital um, and labor are substitutes, and sometimes um, they're complements that relationship gets a little bit complicated, but we want to recognize that most of the time when we talk about things like changes in capital or changes in technology, those things raise the marginal product of workers, and when they do, they raise um, the level of employment and they raise the wages. Uh, so that's really kind of just a basic rundown of um, uh, uh, labor demand um, 
I hope that this format worked well, and I hope that uh, you're able to maybe go back through. I guess I'll post these slides separately if you want to look at it without listening to it. Um, but I hope that uh, that you understand some of the basics, and that as you do the other readings, some of these concepts um, maybe will uh, will show up, and uh, you'll understand them a little bit better.